Welcome back, April 14th, 2021. Yesterday, I was speaking of lies that can be lethal to a society. How when a society accepts too many lies or too many people in, an ex in a society accept too many lies, it creates a generalized nonsense of the intellect. C.S. Lewis put it that way and went on to say, thus a corruption in the will. Lewis went on, we direct the fashionable outcry of each generation against those vices of which it is in the least danger and fix its approval on the virtue that is nearest the vice, which we are trying to make endemic. The game is to have them all running around with fire extinguishers whenever there's a flood and all crowding to that side of the boat, which has already nearly gone under. We spoke of this in the context of lies we tell ourselves or too many of us convinced too many of. From the U.S. as a country of systemic racism to hands up, don't shoot, to listen to the scientists, to calling riots, riots, to cops, hunt minorities, to gender can be assigned. Death ensues from each of these lies, as does mayhem and confusion. Fuddlement which is all, of course, the Leninist effort to make things the worse, so much the better, at least for revolutionary sake. The worse, the better. Not Republican or conservative, but fascist and worse than Hitler. Not great and liberating to others, but imperial and colonialist. Not founded on the natural rights, truths of freedom and equality in 1776, but a far worse and different year based in and on human slavery. This, in some, in, some res, in some respects, is resultant of or part and parcel of what we call the crisis of the West. What is the crisis of the West? As Leo Strauss described it, the West's having become uncertain of its purpose, which was established to preserve the good society based on the bases of reason and science. Tom West elaborates that 20th century history revealed that the progressive spread of democracy throughout the world was hardly assured. Moreover, the good society of Western liberalism no longer looked unquestionably good. Modern philosophy eventually concluded that reason itself was to blame. Not only could reason not establish the good society, it could not even say what the good society was. The crisis of the West is visible in the educated class's abandonment of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Does this nation in its maturity still cherish the faith in which it was conceived and raised, Leo Strauss asks? Does this nation still hold these truths to be self-evident? About a generation ago, an American diplomat could still say that the natural and the divine foundation of the rights of man is self-evident to all Americans. Today, as Thomas West puts it, the very notion of self-evident truths is treated by the elites as equivalent to the belief in ghosts. But why wouldn't a society that dispenses with self-evident truths be susceptible to, if not welcoming and embracing of, lies? and falsehoods. In fact, why wouldn't it be? This is not just a concern of Strauss's. It used to be the classic concern of philosophers and historians throughout history. Can a society that doubts itself survive? In our lifetime, Jean-Francois Ravel put it this way, quote, clearly a civilization that feels guilty for everything it is and does will lack the energy and conviction to defend itself. Two centuries ago, it was the basis of Abraham Lincoln's Lyceum speech, and it was, of course, warned about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before even that in Plato's Republic. That's Athens for you. As for Judeo-Christian values, the entire, the entire warp and woof of biblical commands, be they New or Old Testament, is to unite around a life committed to the preservation and recognized righteousness of God. Am I wrong? There's Jerusalem for you. One can't simply ask what is truth and walk away. 
That's how innocents get slaughtered. So the belief in lies, in too many lies, is something of a project for we conservatives to take on and not in any way quietly. Time to re re retire fake news as a phrase, I say, and start just taking on lies. Call them for what they were. Most people don't like to be lied to, after all. And weirdly enough, a lot of people are happy or content with fake things. So maybe fake news isn't going to work anymore. Let's just talk about lies. People don't like lies. Some people like fake things, jewelry, hair, knockoff brand products come to mind. Lies. Beware the big lie. Beware the dove that goes boom. Adolf Hitler wrote, quote, In the big lie, there was always a certain force of credibility. Because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature than consciously or voluntarily. And thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small lie, since they themselves often tell small lies in little manners, but would be ashamed to resort to large-scale falsehoods. It would never come into their heads to fabricate colossal untruths, and they would not believe that others could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously, even though the facts which prove this to be so may be brought clearly to their minds, they will still doubt and waver and will continue to think that there may be some other explanation." Close quote. A psychological profile of Adolf Hitler's belief in the big lie sounds an awfully lot, a lot like Saul Alinsky's rules. Here's the psychological profile from OSS, quote, his primary rules were never allow the public to cool off, never admit a fault or wrong, never concede that there may be some good in your enemy, never leave room for alternatives, never accept blame, concentrate on one enemy at a time and blame him for everything that goes wrong. People will believe a big lie sooner than a little one. And if you repeat it frankly enough, people will sooner or later believe it completely. Now let's go to Alinsky. Alinsky's rules. Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Never go outside the expertise of your people. Whenever possible, go outside the expertise of the enemy. Make the enemy live up to its own book of rules. Ridicule, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. There is no defense. It is almost impossible to counterattack ridicule. Also, it infuriates the opposition who then react to your advantage. A good tactic is one your people enjoy. A tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. Keep the pressure on. The threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. The major premise for tactics is the development of operations that will maintain a constant pressure upon the opposition. If you push a negative hard and deep enough, it will break through into its counterside. This is based on the principle that every positive has its negative. The price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. From COVID to race and crime, our history, mutable gender, systemic and educational, anything and everything else. How does Valery Legazov, the chief scientist at Chernobyl, put it? Quote, what is the cost of lies? It's not that we'll mistake them for the truth. The real danger is that if we hear enough lies, then we no longer recognize the truth at all, close quote. When you no longer recognize the truth at all anymore, please understand there is a philosophy that attaches to that. It's called relativism. You could write it down and come back on that, Bill. So you contrast regimes of horror and terror, communist and Nazi, as regimes based on the big lie or several big lies. What is our regime based on? Well, it's either truth, self-evident truth, or it's nothing. And if it's nothing, 
there are no trees, no barriers to protect, protect us when the storms come. If it's nothing, it can be communism. If it's nothing, it can or might as well be Nazism. It's not like we, or I should say, they try to hide it either. From hiring airline pilots to names of schools to authors and taught in those schools, race is one of the chief, if not the chief, criteria for the beginning of any, it's also the end of any policy, pedagogical, or hiring and admittance discussion, and it is based on a hierarchy of races. Thomas Jefferson, in his Virginia statute, put it this way, truth is great and will prevail if left to herself, that she is the proper and sufficient antagonist to, to error and has nothing to fear from the conflict unless by human interposition disarmed of her natural weapons, free argument and debate, errors ceasing to be dangerous when it is permitted freely to contradict them. Harry Jaffa put it this way, Western civilization as a whole, and American civilization in particular, is going through a profound period of inner turmoil and change. No doubt some for the better, certainly much of it for the worse. But the cockpit of these changes, their dynamic source, is the university. And the one certain and central fact about the universities is not the bitter division of opinion concerning which changes are for the better and which for the worse, but whether there are any standards by which better and worse can in any way be distinguished at all. There is one thesis that is dominant in the liberal arts curricula today, one that runs through all the social science and humanities departments, namely political science, economics, literature, religion, philosophy, history, psychology, anthropology, and sociology. And that thesis is that there is no objective knowledge of or rational ground for distinguishing between good and bad, right and wrong, just and unjust. All such judgments are said to be value judgments concerning which reason has nothing to say. The essence of a liberal education consists, at least at first, though, in becoming a dilettante of the aesthetic ideals expressed in art and architecture, and sculpture and music and literature, and learning to savor the varieties of lifestyles expressed in books, religions, philosophies, and cultures. What education displays for us is the variety of forms that human imagination and human taste, including moral taste, takes, but it never tells us that one is truer, more beautiful, or more just than another. It never tells us that human choice can be guided, as the signers of the Declaration of Independence believed it could be, by the truth about man, God, and the universe. The thing is, there is truth. That is the thing. And a government founded on recognizing that is a government that should never tolerate or accept lies, big or small, for the tolerance of the small always leads to the acceptance of the big. As I said yesterday, we can keep playing these games and keep going down the same road, watching things get worse and worse, or we can stop, point out the lies, and begin to turn not only ourselves, but our culture around. I'm Seth Liebson. We'll be right back.